Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? <clears throat> so I want to talk about something first before we get into the devotion, because I think people have forgotten a particular series of verses in the Bible on this subject, and there's much debate about this. I see another really big date about to be set because of a certain thing happening on that day. So I want to share this with you guys out of Matthew 24, starting in verse 36. And this series of verses is titled in the Bible, No One Knows That Day and Hour. Now, a lot of people debate about this and what this is referring to. Let's read it and see what it says. Let's read it and see what it's pointing to. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. What day or hour? All the stuff before that that he was describing. And again, keep in mind, verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So we can trust these words. Verse 37, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Now I want you to stop and think about this for a minute. Because a lot of people are like, no, Matthew 24 only refers to the tribulation. Okay, have you read the seals? Do you really think they're going to be eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage? Because in the seals, it shows that there, um, everybody in the world is going to be running for their lives. If they're doing that in the seals, what about the rest of the time? You know, it won't be happening, be happening then either. This is describing normal life. Eating and drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Normal life. That means before the tribulation. Until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay? When they entered the ark, everybody saw this. Oh, it's fine. They were warned, and they saw the fruition of this warning. It's 120 years of warning come to pass. Okay, he's got animals in the boat and they're in the boat. You would think people would be like, okay, maybe there's something to this. We need to pay more attention. Maybe we need to ask some questions. But see, at that point, it was too late. The door was shut because God shut the door. How funny, at a certain point, God's going to shut the door on all this and there will be nobody entering. Jesus makes his mention of this multiple parables. I don't know you or from where you come. Ten virgins, wedding feast. It wasn't until the flood came that everybody realized what had happened. Revelation chapter 6, verse 6. They knew what was happening because the rapture had happened. They were taken up. Now, there's still a lot of debate on the following verses as to what this is referring to. Matthew 24, 40. These two men, or then two men, will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Okay, if, it's, if this is the tribulation, how is this normal life that they're doing? There's no, in the tribulation, there's no normal life. Read the book of Revelation. It tells you. We're going through Isaiah. We're going through Ezekiel. We've been through Jeremiah. There's no normal life. As Ezekiel is saying, they're, they're going to drink this stuff with stress. They're going to eat their food with stress. This is normal life. What's happening here? One will be taken, the other will be left, indicating there are going to be people that are going to vanish before the eyes of other people. While they're in the middle of doing what they're doing, boom, gone. And he warns, watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. We'll know the season, but we will not know the, know the day. Verse 43, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. You don't know when the thief is coming. How can you? Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. He says it twice. 
Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all of his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming, and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him, and at an hour that he is not aware of. He said it three times. When he says it more than once, you listen. When he says it three times, you better remember it. He will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You don't think Christians will be in the tribulation? Well, evidently he's going to get those unfaithful servants and do this to them. And if Matthew 24 is referring to the tribulation, hello. The point of this is we're not going to know the day that he's coming. Because he told us three times in that series of verses, we're not going to know when he's coming. And what do we have happening? They just did, was it uh, June 11th through the 13th? Okay, the rapture's good. They're starting to get blocks of days now. The rapture's going to happen between June 11th and 13th. That's a high watch time. Every day's a high watch time. Look around the world. Every day's a high watch time. And those days came and went. Again. Wrong. Again. And they continue to be wrong. And they will continue to be wrong. Because we won't know what hour he's coming. We can't know. It's not for us to know. It's for us to walk in faith. And to believe his word. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will by no means pass away. Matthew 24, 35. If the Lord said it's going to happen that way, that's how it's going to happen. There's nothing we can do or say that will change it. That's the call to all those out there doing this because you are destroying people's faith by what you're doing you don't see a problem with it everybody out here does because we see the damage you're doing and i implore everyone that's involved in this to stop doing it to stop being involved in this because whenever you get involved in this even just watching can put you in alignment with their sin for the people that are doing this. It is a dangerous practice. Many a people have walked away from the faith because of this. And if you're considering yourself some form of watchman, God said if something like that happens, he's requiring their blood at your hands. So there's judgment coming. That brings us to morning devotion. Sorry to start that way, but this has to be addressed. This is a dangerous practice to set dates, dangerous. And it is not something that should be promoted in any way, shape, or form. And the Bible denounces it. For June 19th, we are going to be reading out of Acts 2-4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Let's go to Acts 2-4. Let's go ahead and just start at the top there, but the whole verse is, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Notice it wasn't something they did forcefully. It wasn't something they did by their will. It was something that was done because of the Holy Spirit. Every person I've ever read about or heard about that has truly spoken in tongues, it was an utterance that they weren't even aware of. But the people around them heard it. Ron Wyatt gave an account where he said that uh, I spoke in tongues and didn't even know I was speaking in tongues because they had taken him prisoner in Saudi Arabia when they found Mount, the Mount Sinai and they were interviewing and interrogating them and as they were talking he said the, the, he, he could kind of understand what they were talking about they were speaking in Arabic and he kind of understand what they were talking about and immediately the words came to him oh what do you think Musa would think about this? Because he knows in their in their belief system, uh, Moses is uh, high, very high ranking, and they call him Musa. And he, he said, "In my head, I heard that I, I heard myself speak in English." He said, "But they started jumping around, acting crazy, freaking out." 
And he turned and looked at, at his interpreter, and his interpreter had a look of shock on his face. And he said, you just spoke perfect Arabic. No, I didn't. I spoke English. He goes, no, you spoke Arabic. Everybody in the room heard it. So he wasn't even aware of it. And now we see proof of that here in verse 4. As the Spirit gave them utterance, it's not something you do willfully. The Holy Spirit will do this through you. So when these people do this stuff, I, there's more proof in the Bible that it's nonsense what they're doing. It's no private prayer language. I used to think that. No, it's not. It's no special language of angels. Angels don't talk in gibberish. They speak quite clearly. Everybody in the Bible who's ever talked to angels hear them quite clearly and quite specifically. So it's all nonsense. It's all demonic. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, key word there, fully. There's a big debate about that. I have a theory on that, and I've done videos on it. Whenever you read about the day of Pentecost and everybody celebrates it early in the summer, particular particular admission here in uh, previously that these men are drunk on new wine. In fact, I think it's in this ver this chapter. These men are drunk on new wine. Well, there's only one time new wine was available in Israel at that time, and that's in August and September. Could be as early as July, but usually it's August. But if you go look in the Bible and see the count for Pentecost, you see there's 49 days missing from the count because of just one word being changed a little bit to make it seem like that 45, uh, 49 days isn't there. I mean, when you add that 49 days, it puts you in the time of when new wine would be available in Israel. But classically, we've always been taught, count 50 days, that's it. Well, there's an extra 49 days that's supposed to be added on after that. So, when the day, notice it's capitalized, of Pentecost, the final day, had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared the, uh, to them divided tongues as of fire. It would be, look like flames of fire. And one sat on each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, meaning every language. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. What they were hearing wasn't what the apostles were experiencing. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? They were all from lower Galilee. Aren't they all these rednecks? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? These are unlearned men, according to us, according to, to, to um, opinion, uh, public opinion. How are they speaking in our language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya, adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Notice no angels language, no, no gibberish was being speak, spoken here, it was all actual languages. Others mocking said they are full of new wine. That's a key series of words there because if they are full of new wine, that if they if they were accusing that, if they were thinking, maybe there was new wine available. If that's the case, we're missing 49 days on our Pentecost count, which would put Pentecost in the realm of new wine. Because Peter, standing up, with the eleven raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words, for these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. So he's proving that that extra 49 days are missing because he's saying they're not drunk. It's only the third hour. How, how can we be drunk? There's a, there's a, a hidden indicator that there was new wine available. And if that's the case, we've got Pentecost on the wrong day. And we've had it like that for a long time. Long, long time. 
when you go look and do that extra count, when you go into Leviticus and take, count that extra 49 days, it puts it right in the middle of the time frame where it should be. It changes a whole lot of understanding. Let's get into our devotion. I guess that's that's a, a subject to dig, dig into in another video, and I have dug into it in 2019, and I believe I did it again in 2020. Rich were the blessings of this day if all of us were filled with the Holy Ghost. The consequences of this sacred filling of the soul, it would be impossible to overestimate. Life, comfort, light, purity, power, peace, and many other precious blessings are inseparable from the Spirit's benign presence. As sacred oil, he anoints the head of the believer, sets him apart, sets him apart to the priesthood of saints, and gives him grace to execute his office aright. As the only truly purifying water, he cleanses us from the power of sin and sanctifies us into holiness. Notice it says it does it cleanse us from sin, but the power of sin. The keys are always in the wording. And sanctifies us unto holiness, working in us to will and to do of the Lord's good pleasure. As the light, he manifests it to us at first, our lost estate. And now he reveals the Lord Jesus to us and in us and guides us in the ways of righteousness. How is Jesus revealed in you? The way you live. Somebody should be able to look at you as a Christian and say, that is a Christian. I don't know who Christians are, and I'm not a Christian, but I'm looking at that person. That is what I would think a Christian would be. You ever want to know who a Christian is? Have an unbeliever or even an atheist. They should be able to look at you and go, it even though I don't know what a Christian would look like, even though I, I, I'm not a Christian, you are what I imagine a Christian would be because they read the Bible and they know what the behavior is. And when they see it in an individual, and I've only seen this ever twice, where somebody who wasn't a believer pointed to someone else and said, I don't know how this is supposed to play out, but what I imagine a Christian should be is that person right there. These others, no. That one, yes. And if the ungodly world can point it out, why can't we? Why won't we? Because the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus Christ in us. And that is revealed in the life we live. The way we conduct ourselves. How we operate. Enlightened by his pure celestial ray, we are no more darkness but light in the world. As fire... He both purges us from dross and sets our consecrated nature on a blaze. He is the sacrificial lamb by which we are enabled to offer our whole souls as a living sacrifice unto God. As heavenly dew, he removes our barrenness and fertilizes our lives. Oh, that he would drop from above upon us at this early hour. Such a morning dew would be a sweet commencement for the day. As the dove... With wings of peaceful love, he broods over his church and over the souls of believers. And as a comforter, he dispels the cares and doubts which mar the peace of his beloved. He descends upon the chosen as upon the Lord in Jordan, and bears witness to their sonship by working in them a philal spirit, by which they cry, Abba, Father. As the wind, he brings the breath of life to men, blowing where he listeth. He performs the quickening operations by which the spiritual creation is animated and sustained. Would to God that we might feel his presence this day and every day. With everything that's going on, should we not be more focused on what the Lord is doing in the believer? And not just ourselves, but all believers. Should we not be more concerned with, Lord, am I living the life you gave me? Am I doing the office you put me in? And remember, your ministry isn't necessarily standing in front of people and preaching. Your ministry can be a mother taking care of her children, a father taking care of his household, operating a business in a Christian manner. Our office doesn't have to be in a pulpit. Our office doesn't have to be video content on YouTube. Our office doesn't have to be a social media ministry.
We are to do what he gave us to do. We are to live the life he put before us. And we do those things and we live that life glorifying him. The way to show the Holy Spirit dwells in us is the way we conduct ourselves here, now, in everyday life. It's so simple. And people overly complicate. Overly complicate this process. The Lord will grow you if you work within what he's given you. But too often, we're told and we're convinced and we convince ourselves that we need to strive above and beyond that. Sometimes it's just one person in front of you or a child that you're taking care of or or an elderly person or something. Sometimes it's just you. He doesn't give us more than we can bear. Though sometimes it feels like we can't bear it. Those are those moments when he's testing us, when he's strengthening us, when he's purging us. If we could just learn to live for God in this everyday life, learn to live for the Lord in everything that we do, in the job we do, in the things that we perform. If we just could learn to live for him and glorify him in those things, what a wonderful, peaceful life we would have. Keep it simple, stupid. The acronym is KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. Not, don't overcomplicate things that the Lord didn't overcomplicate. He'll grow us. He'll, he'll strengthen us. He'll teach us. And I tell you this from experience. The more I've learned, the, the, less, the less I want to add details to the situation. The more I've learned in the last three and a half years, the less I've, I've focused on trying to get so elaborate in things. I mean, back in 2019, when I first started this ministry, I was doing up to 15 videos a day. And people were like, how is it possible that you're doing this? The Lord. <laughs> it's the only way. Because I'm putting out more content than there are hours in the day. I don't know how that's possible. It's the Lord. But the more I've learned, the more I've realized none of that, none of that matters that much. The important thing is every day living for him. Devoting the day to him. Devoting time to him. Devoting time to his word glorifying him and showing his glory in the life that we live. That could be something as simple as helping a stranger. That could be something as simple as a kind word to somebody who needs it. That could be something as simple as good morning. How are you all doing today? To a counter of convenience store employees who look tired and worn out and beat up because they've had to deal with unruly customers all day. And you being that one ray of light, that ray of sunshine, and I've been called that multiple times in a gloomy day that didn't really have much hope in it. I've had people testify to me, you know, I saw you yesterday and you came in and you said hi and your bright shining face and, and, and I've heard that so many times I've started to realize there's a reason why they see that because Moses, his face was bright and shining as the Holy Spirit grows in him. My day was excellent after that. I went home, I was actually singing while I was cooking dinner. And everybody was wondering what was wrong with me. I used to not understand what that was. It actually made me uncomfortable. But now I realize what it is. Keep it simple, stupid. Let the Holy Spirit work in you. Let the Holy Spirit reveal to other people who you are. You don't need to do it. Let the Holy Spirit do it. Because when the Holy Spirit does it, it's way more genuine than us promoting ourselves because that self-promotion leads to pride. Us trying to make ourselves look like we have the Holy Ghost comes off as a cheap hustle than if we just step back and just let the Holy Spirit do the work. 
Because when he does it, then that's perfect worship, perfect sacrifice, a perfect unveiling of who we are to the world, setting us up on the bushel so the light can shine, making us the salt and the light. That's the Holy Spirit's ministry. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory, to lift you up and to sing praises unto your holy name. Father, thank you for this word and this devotion. Thank you for this morning that we can come together and join in prayer to you and worship and sacrifice, giving you of our time, giving you glory, giving you praise, giving thanks for the wonderful, wonderful blessings you pour out on us every day. The blessing of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, changing us, correcting our understanding, making our light to shine ever brighter so that even the world around us sees it and wonders. In these three and a half years of doing this ministry, the more you've shown me, the more I've realized it doesn't have to be so complicated. The more you reveal, the, the, the less details need to be in the equation. And the message comes across so much clearer when there's less details, there's, there's less distractions, there's less extra stuff. We don't have to promote ourselves. You promote us to the world. You show the people and put it in their hearts. When it's time for me, I know who to go to. When I have this weird feeling and I'm really feeling a lot of conviction, I know who to go to. That's the person I know is a Christian. I can trust them because they'll give me the truth. And when you speak as a Christian, people listen. I've noticed this even recently with individuals that I know who start a conversation about stuff like that. And when I start talking, they immediately listen. Because when I speak, I speak like I know what I'm talking about. And it's not even me speaking, it's the Holy Spirit speaking. Some people won't listen. Some people, all they're thinking about is what the dogs are doing. And they want to tell you about the little things of their day. And so when you're talking about those things, they're not listening. But those words will come to remembrance at the perfect time. And they will remember those things. And they will spread that word. They will share that. The Holy Spirit does such an amazing work in all of us. And can take a single message and spread it throughout thousands of people. A message of hope, a message of love, a message of true salvation, real salvation. Christ's salvation. Father, thank you for these testimonies that we have. Thank you for these opportunities that we have. Thank you for these situations in our lives when we're having to deal with secular people. And it's stressful, and, and it's frustrating, and it's saddening. We have our own version of weeping and gnashing of teeth because we're so frustrated with some of the stuff we're having to deal with and some of the things people are bringing to us. But I had to pause there. That banner caught my eye. <laughs> but it's all in your hands. These things purge us. These things sharpen our faith, sharpen our understanding, bring peace, show us the truth, reveal to us the nature, remind us of what our nature used to be, sets the door open before us or I should say sets an open door before us that we can walk through. Shows us very clearly where the narrow path is. Very clearly where the gate is that we must pass through as your children. Showing us the difference. Showing us more, more in living color the, the, the travesty that it is this world and what we should be avoiding. 
So I thank you for these things. I thank you for these moments. Thank you for these troubles, these, these people that are constantly in our lives causing us distress. Because it will make the joy that much greater when the time comes. Wonderful, wonderful day of redemption is coming for everybody. We don't know when that day is. You told us in your word, in Matthew 24, you're not going to know the hour that I'm coming. You're not going to be aware of it. So many people have misused that, but we don't. Because we know that that means not to watch for that single day, but to know what season we're in. And when we're in that season, to watch and always be watching. And right now, Father, we are watching. We're watching in prayer. We're watching in real life. We're waiting. We're listening. And we're sharing the truth with as many as we can, as much as we can. Sometimes it's not very much. But you weren't really a, a guy for quota. You weren't really a God that's in, you know, focused on quotas. If we can preach to one our whole lives and they get saved, that's it's worth it. You just are looking for people who are willing to do it. Even if we never get to. We're willing to do it. That goes a long way. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your free gift of salvation. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for revealing to us where we stand so that if we need to move, we can move and showing us where to move. Thank you for these troubles, these trials, these issues, because they make us better and prepare us for the greatest joy we will ever experience on that day. And maybe, just maybe, we can take some people with us. <clears throat> in Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you all for joining me for morning prayer. It's no small thing to be a Christian. It's no small thing to be saved. It is the most important thing. We celebrate our birthday every year, the day that we were born into this world. But you know the one day we don't celebrate is the day we were reborn. <clears throat> Have you ever seen anybody or heard of anybody that does that? We look for that cake with all the candles on it or the number of candles on it because we don't want to burn the house down, depending on how old we are. Or the presents. Would you get me? Would you get me? Oh, that's just what I wanted. Oh, that's awesome. People going all out on this stuff. I've seen people buy kids $60,000 Mustangs. Like, why are you doing that? long time ago, I got to the point, I don't even want to celebrate my birthday anymore. It's just not that important to me. The day I was born is nowhere near as important as the day I die, because the day I die, I leave a void behind. What do I leave as a legacy to take up that space? It should be living for others. It should be glorifying God. It should be leaving something behind that will be an eternal benefit to all those around me with the season that we're in I may never see that day that's a blessing that's incredible to be one of the ones that gets taken up and never sees death incredible because only a few have ever had that luxury in the Bible two that I can recount I never hear of anybody ever celebrating the day they were reborn. Most people don't even know the day that it happened. But you know what? God does. On that day of redemption, we will too. In fact, we're going to learn a whole lot of things on that day of redemption. We're going to know a lot of things on that day of redemption, mainly where we stand. I'm looking forward to that day personally. But until that day comes, 
while I'm still here, I want to try to do as much as I can according to the Lord's will as I can. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in because the Holy Spirit shows us what to do, reveals to us what to do, what to say, when to say it, when to do it, and to whom. And it takes time to learn how to listen to the Holy Spirit. We don't do it perfectly. We can't. But he helps us. A lot. If it wasn't for having the Holy Spirit in me, I, I, I wouldn't be here. That's how important the Holy Spirit is to me. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name. And I will see you in the next video.